Oh, the reason I'm, I'm panting like an old man is uh, I had a horrible bout of insomnia last night, which meant a two o'clock start. And then when I made a mistake this morning, it cost me exactly 179 pounds. Yes, 179 pounds literally burnt in a single moment of insanity. My rotating clock divider managed to break that today. I connected it to this device, this breakout switch that seemed to break it. So I thought, well, maybe I've not got the power connected properly. So I switched the ribbon upside down. And uh, what Sandy warned about power and being able to blow stuff up was not apocryphal. Smoke started coming out of the clock divider. The other thing that's really annoying is I seem to have this sixth sense of when I'm about to do some something really kind of Homer Simpson-y, at which point I tend to switch the cameras off. So not only have I burnt 179 quid, literally up in smoke, I didn't get it on camera either. So I've been flagellating myself going up the toughest way up to Crow Hill this morning. Now, last week I said that I was going to present to you my finished rig version 1.0. I think I was getting ahead of myself by one week. But let me take you up to date with where I'm at. Another make noise unit. The Wogglebug, a random VCO and LFO to add a bit of unpredictable into my life, to give my frankincense even more of a mind of its own, more unpredictable autonomy and that all important out of the box ephemera. I've also finally unsheathed some utility modules, which I have no idea what they're for, but Alex, my Euro crack dealer, said I needed them. And then, yes, this breakout unit for my rotating clock divider, and there she is. Now into my rig, do you want to see the module go up in smoke? Here we go, and no, didn't record it. Really is a lot steeper than it looks. Okay, because this week's been a bit of a catalogue of errors. I also, whilst putting those utility units in, threw away the boxes, and because they're pretty much unbranded, I don't know one who made them, what they're called, and how they work. If any of you can be any of help with these devices here, it would be much appreciated. Right, a few more yards to the top of Crow Hill and coffee. So I've put a pile of stuff in to the rig this week and we are getting closer, but there's just one more piece of the jigsaw for this week to go in and then we're gonna have a look at this kind of random element of the rig. I've been using the maths module as an ADSR, but I want to keep maths for clever mathsy stuff. So I've bought a dedicated ADSR by Befaco. I think that's what they're called anyway. Out comes the big IntelliGel synth, and then in goes my new ADSR. Now, whilst this is all sped up, you won't be seeing the countless mistakes my jazzy sausage fingers make with all of these pesky tiny little screws. I lose at least one every time I insert a module. The other thing you're also not aware of is that I'm barefoot, and this is a great way to find these tiny little rat screws by embedding them in your crusty horned heels. Here we go, as you would expect, but also connect an LFO from maths into the attack CV input on the ADSR and... Interesting. Ah, success. The pain subsides and the euphoria starts to dribble through your system. Now, for those of you who follow my normal vlog, not the modular one, there was a thing I did about wild tracks linked above and below, and this guy in Connecticut asked me to send a few over so he could conduct some experiments. Hi, Christian. Quite a few folks were asking in the comments last week about the convolution techniques that I was talking about. So I thought this week I would just dive straight into the computer and uh, show you how I set that up in Ableton. Okay, so this is my live setup. It's quite simple, really. One contact track here in Ableton, which is loaded up with our new British Drama Toolkit library, uh, just as something to play into my returns, so you can hear what that sounds like. I also have an audio track here, so I can demonstrate the audio that I'm loading into my convolution reverb. And I've got return track over here set up. Let's have a little listen to what the audio sounds like, the contact instance sounds like, without any of the effects. Okay, so what I've got that going into here is my convolution return track. 
I've got a few things here disabled, which I'll explain in just a moment. The first one here is Convolution Reverb Pro. Now this is a Max for Live device. I've got this set up, and instead of loading in an impulse response, like you normally would into a Convolution Reverb, which would be the sound of the room decaying, I've loaded that with this audio track here, which is, soon this is your wild, I think it's some geese or some ducks, and you can hear a little bit of water and so on going on. So this is the audio that I put in. So you can hear it's quite sonically rich and interesting. There's lots of different noises there. So if I turn up the send here so that the audio from our contact instance is now going into that, uh, this is just the Convolution Reverb Pro that you're hearing alongside the original recording. And you can hear it sort of tickling along there, it's very quiet. So what I normally do is, I haven't found a very suitable way to turn up the gain or put a sort of gain in here, so I've just got a compressor. It's not actually doing any compressing, I'm just literally using it for its gain. So if I turn that on, now I'll play some notes in. And now what you're hearing isn't the sound of British Drama Toolkit, this is the convolution alone. So it sort of tumbles along and you get these slight variations in the, in the timbre of it um, as it goes through that sound. Now you can do all sorts of clever things like changing the size and that would be the size of the room typically. Uh, really that's that's choosing the, uh, the sort of scrub speed through the audio. So if I was to set that, you can see it's about 50 seconds or so. If I was to set that to 50%, it jumps down to a much shorter 20 seconds or you can work it right up to 200% and it's like a minute and a half long. That's a little bit excessive for what I want right right now, but you know, it's great for sort of really slow ambient stuff. I'll say it's about 105, 104%. So it's under a minute long. And just to add a little bit more sort of timbral variation and some rhythmic interest into it, I've used Air Pusher here, uh, which is a preset of the Beat Repeat plugin. It's actually manipulated some of the settings here. One of the things I've turned right up is the variation. I've put it onto auto, I've enabled triplets, and just mess around with the settings until I found a sort of sweet spot that I like. Um, I've also got it doing a little bit of filtering and I've got it set in a mix setting. You can use insert here and it sounds very dramatic. I've done that on a few tracks, but mix here is a little bit more subtle. You get a little bit of the original signal as well as the affected signal. And then finally, just because this isn't actually a convolution reverb, there's no sort of natural decay on it. I've put another reverb on the end of here, uh, just a hall reverb, three seconds long, just to soften the sound as it reaches the end of this, so it doesn't just stop abruptly. So with all of that enabled, let's hear what that sounds like now. Again, what you're hearing here isn't you now the recording that's not contact you're hearing. This is just everything else playing out as those sounds that are fed in. You know, it adds like a, a good minute of sound. It's great for when you're performing live. It gives you something to sort of feed into so you don't have that uh, risk of ending up with complete silence. I mentioned that you could put this into insert mode and it sounds a little bit more dramatic just for, just for reference. Let's hear what that sounds like. And I'll turn off the reverb here so it sounds a little bit more direct and abrupt. Here, as it cuts between the effect of the beat repeat and the original signal, uh, you get a little bit more sort of rhythmic interest going on. Uh, it's really great for much softer sounds like this because it adds a little bit more sort of timbral richness to the sound. 
that's not necessarily in the original signal. So I see this is smooth, this is stepped, and this is woggle. And um, maybe we should get a camera with a good lens on this. No, you haven't missed anything. It's woggle bug time. Simply patched into an herb verb for stereo ness, then a camera close up because the woggle bug is quite tasty looking when all powered on and lit up. Right, this time with a camera. So we've got a basically a smooth uh, VCO, a Wogglebug VCO, and the stepped. So they sound, just whack that in. And the woggly one. stepped okay so these I think on this side are the kind of uh, in the, 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 the clock information that you can feed in these are the CV out step smooth woggle and then uh, it can generate its own internal clock and I don't know what the burst is let's have a look Square burst output is the square random gate signal. So this is stepped square clock signal from the internal clock generator, not influenced by signal at external click input. Okay, I think I understand that. Okay, so this is me lying. I haven't a clue what they're going on about. I believe our kind of influence is going in. Interesting. Okay, so let's how see how that affects. I guess what's helpful about hearing these different VCOs, which I'm probably never going to use because they're so totally random, is that I get a sense of what the LFOs are going to do. Patching the Wogglebock into a CV on the herb verb. Interesting-ish. What I'm hoping to use this for is feeding it incredibly slow clocks so it spits out intermittent random events. Um, and because my clock divider is broken, I can't really demonstrate that today, but I'll, I'll hopefully get either a replacement or this fixed uh, for next week. Um, this is the kind of stage that I'm at with, with the rig, and I feel that I'm basically missing two components. One is a, some form of sample playback, and I know you can do that with the disting, but I'm also interested in the very kind of interesting tape splicing stuff that's going on in the modular world. And the other thing is what I would refer to as an if circuit. At the moment, what we've got is a, a kind of a closed circuit. We can control the notes that are being played and we can get them to interact, play off each other, even create a degree of chaos either with something like this or indeed by just introducing kind of feedback loops. What I want to do, and, and as I maybe two episodes ago showed, is I'm capable of kind of creating something that I can jam against. Now, what I want to do is I want the Franken synth to kind of jam with me. So I want to introduce some external influences into what I would call an if circuit. So if X event happens, basically this will react 
either in a predictable way or in an unpredictable way by maybe utilizing something like the woggle bug. So it's time for me to power down for now. <laughs> Alex, you're all right, good to see you. I'm just going to talk to you about, other than using for kind of research reasons, this is a kind of a, a sample playback. Is there anything else that you recommend in that respect? So there's a number of samplers in Eurorack. I think it was the kind of in vogue thing at, like, at, at Superbooth like last year, and right. the box kind of started to come to market. Depends what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Some of these are samplers, and some of these are sample players. players. This is quite new in a rack, so I can yeah. probably tell you more about this okay. than I can tell you about the STS. We've got a patch here mm -hmm. where we've got a kind of simple synthesizer yep. going into morphogen, and then the stereo out. Now the other question I had was this idea of a, a kind of creating an, an if circuit, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, of something, <clears throat> an event coming in that creates another event, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, that, that, that external. Yep. So we'll use, yeah, we'll just use exactly the same patch. Mm -hmm. This morphogen patch, and then that control, the gene size control. Yep. So what I'm going to do is using this contact mic, which has an envelope follower and a gate out. So I'll let you hear the audio from it. So, gotcha. So it turns your <laughs> system into a, a, an instrument. Um, it outputs an envelope mm -hmm. based on the microphone or the, the sound. That the okay. Microphone's receiving, and it outputs a gate signal as well, okay. based on the, a, like a threshold that where the microphone is high, I'll be able to affect the gene size. Really the like the is going well. Oh no, really I'm just, I'm just, things. yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Thanks so much okay. for your help. No See you soon. Take care. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Next week, I really will have the completed module, and I think I'm going to be gearing up for my first proper performance of this kind of new project that I've been thinking about for nearly a year now. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you like what I do, hit like. And if you want to be notified when this video and any others go up, hit the, the little bell button. And because, well, because I'm feeling a bit sorry for myself because I literally toasted one of my modules today. I thought I'd cheer myself up by putting the rest of these new modules that uh, Alex has recommended to me into my rig. So I settled for a make noise morphinogen, well they can invent these words, doesn't mean I can pronounce them, tape splicing sampler thingy, a mutable instrument's ears for my external influencer and another disting mark for the Swiss army knife of modules. More of those next week. Ah, success. The pain subsides and the euphoria starts to dribble through your bottom. <laughs> hey. Ah.